This message is brought to you by danmolerarchive.com, the number one place to search over 2,500 Dan Moeller messages in growing. Now, please enjoy this message. Sounds like you're doing okay. There's, there's more kids here than there was the last time I was here. There's a lot of children, little. She said the kiddos, I thought the whole place was going to empty out there. She said about the kiddos leaving, and I thought, wow, there's a lot of children. So I don't know what Adam's been preaching lately. But obviously, he started in the beginning of the book. So let me encourage you. You guys got Genesis 1 down pat. You got it. You're working it, okay? If you turn the page, there's a lot of good gospel the rest of the way. So I'm just here to affirm, you got the first chapter down pat. <laughs> You're doing great. So, uh, good deal. So, uh, wow. Man, I got some... I feel happy too, but I have some, some sobering things on my heart. So I'm just going to share them. It's not, not, not heavy, not condemning. Just, I think we need to be sober and diligent, right? And, and not lose sight of who we are now that He came. And uh, something I've been crying out lately, I can't help it. It's like a mandate on my heart. Uh, there's so many things you can preach when you're up here. I mean, get real. I've been preaching for a while now. I've been saved 22 years and I preach all the time. So what do I have? I'm probably, in a, I'm probably looking at a 50... 55 minute time frame, that's like more challenging than it is hard for me. Like as far as challenging to what do I say for that short a time. And uh, there's a lot of things I could say this morning that would probably pass and people say, well, that was encouraging, that was nice, or talk on a topic. But lately there's been this mandate, I can't explain it on my heart, every time I get people in front of me and they hand me a microphone. And I really feel like it's a mandate. I believe it's the love of God and the heart of God and the wisdom of God trying to cry out from the rooftop and prepare us to live our lives and stay in Him and continue to shine and be influential in the midst of whatever comes or goes. I, I get concerned that a lot of us, we have, we have the idea we've been preached a gospel in a way that we have an idea that this gospel is here to serve us. To make sure our day goes smooth or better, or our life goes better. And that's never been the intention of the gospel. The, the gospel talks about the wise man encountering storms, that rains come into the wise man. This isn't a negative message. This is a it's a preparing type thing. Like, I think we're misguided if if we believe we're a Christian for our sake, so that now we're a Christian, God's going to take care of everything that concerns me in such a way that I won't be challenged. And if, if that's the case, then when you are challenged, it'll consume your identity, your time, your moment, your emotions, and your expression. If all you believe is God's here to make sure your day goes better, and now that you have God, He's always going to defend and take care in a certain sense. And there's a truth about defending and protecting, and I'll, and I'll make sure that that's real clear, clearly conveyed today. But I've watched a lot of people, they go through stuff and get so caught off guard and taken back because of what they were believing the gospel is. So uh, I'm just going to be frank with you. We're not Christians to go to heaven. It's, it's not at it at all. We're not Christians just for the blessing of the Lord. We're like not Christians just so He sits at an administrative desk and makes sure everything goes the way you would order it. That has nothing to do with why you're Christian. Zero. I'm not talking... Christianity is somewhat like that. It's zero while you're a Christian. Like you're not a Christian for that at all. You're a Christian so that in the midst of life, you think like He thinks, you act like He acts, you love like He loves. You're, you're a Christian to be like Him. So that when things come and when things happen, when, when, when things are unjust, when things are outside of the realm of mercy, you don't let those things decide who you are because you've already been settled in what you've become a part of and who He is in you and what you believe. Are you following what I'm saying here? I, I, I see... I'm sorry about the passion that comes on me, the intensity. I don't, I don't mean to be negative. I can't help it. It comes on me and there's nothing I can do about it. I feel like I want to cry and I'm sorry. It, it's just real to me. I, I, I've, I've been doing this thing for a while, very involved with people and I... Look in their eyes, and I've shared countless hours with people one-on-one -on -one and behind the scenes and in this setting. And There's a lot of people discouraged. There's a lot of people that we're talking about 
saving the city and winning the city, that, that expression about touching York City, there's a lot of people discouraged that come to church. And the reason they're discouraged is because they're, ex they're assessing their level of encouragement slash discouragement based on their life circumstances, happenings, and, 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 and stuff. Instead of their relationship with God, their purpose, their destiny, and their true reason for being. Listen, here, this will help. The Bible says, when you come to Jesus to deny yourself, pick up your cross and follow Him. It says to love not your own life unto death. It says to endure hardship as a good soldier. The Gospel makes all kinds... It says to love less your own mom and dad, your spouse, your children, your houses, your land, and yes, your own life. And if you don't love those things less, you'll never be my disciple. He didn't say you won't walk in a faith that believes your sins are forgiven. He said, you'll never be my disciple. He didn't say, go make confessing Christians. He said, go make disciples. He didn't say, make people that attend church. Go make people that believe I'll take them to heaven. He said, go make disciples of every nation. He said, if you don't love less, that list, that's the most intimate list in your and my life. There's a reason. See, all that list comes from Him and who He is. Like, God never gave us the blessing of children at the cost of who He is. Like, He didn't give us children and run the risk of, wow, if anything tragic would ever happen or unfortunate, wow, it, it, it's on me. God didn't give us the blessing of life at the cost of who gave us life. He gave us the blessing of life so that in life we manifest Him and make Him known through it all. Are you guys with me? I know I'm being sober and it's a little stiff in here a little bit, but I hope you're just listening. Open your heart. This isn't negative. This is empowering. It's in my heart this way. Unless you love less, you'll never be my disciple. A disciple is a wholehearted follower, a disciplined learner. Unless you love less that list. Why? Because if not, anything on that list, you don't even realize it, you could set up to be a target. It becomes a target. We say things like this. We give ourselves away. Boy, if that just happens one more time, I'm just going to die. I don't know what I'm going to do. I just can't take it anymore. And you give yourself away and you reveal that it's really all about you and how it's going and all your highest hope is that things change for you. Instead of manifesting Him in the midst of whatever it is. See, when you say, I can't take it anymore, that's just, you're just making yourself a target. You're just opening yourself up. You're, you're giving yourself away. That would be like Jesus healing a whole city, and they're sitting around trying to decide what evil spirit is working through him. Do you guys know that's scriptural? Like, he's the Lord. He heals the whole city, and people are like, now I wonder what devil's moving through him. That would be like Jesus saying, man, you know, I just don't think I'm healing anybody else. You know, they just don't appreciate me. I'll tell you, I do all this good and they call me evil. Come on, guys. You don't do the good for recognition. You don't do the good for acknowledgement. You do the good because it's good. You don't love to be loved. You love because it's love. It's not conditional. It never fails. It's not do you love me. It's never that's not fair. I'll tell you what's not fair. The Spirit of God lives in me. That's not fair. Come on. <laughs> Come on. You want to talk fair? That's not fair. I'm going to live forever. Ah! Not fair. I've been forgiven of everything I've ever done outside of Him. Amen. Forgiven. It's done. I am clean in the sight of God. That's not fair. That's His love. And because I believe it, it's changed me. And it's made me never again want to be those things. Amen. I didn't find a way for a better life. I found a way for a new one. Amen. Yeah? I didn't become a Christian so He takes care of me. I became a Christian so I could be empowered to become what it is He made me for. <laughs> so that if people do treat you wrong, you don't become wrong. 
So when people do forsake you, you don't become forsaken. You guys okay? Please be okay. I'm not going to put you too bad on the spot. I'm just going to talk plain, Jake. I saw Jake at the door and Crystal. I know them from way back when they were just kids. Makes me want to cry. His daddy just passed unexpectedly. When I saw him, tears just wanted to flood me. I didn't want to cry in a bad way because I, I, I just, it was good to see you. You could tell that. It was healthy. It was good to see you, Miss Crystal, and hug you. And they said, they didn't say the right things. They said the right things because I could see it's what they're believing and yet it's difficult. It's, and he expressed that. But they're moving forward and they know that's what they're called to. And stuff happens. Sometimes you get a phone call you never want to get. But I need to ask you all, does that change the gospel and why you're here and who He is in you? No, that's when all that's supposed to come to pass. Like everything we're training for. See, why do we come here? To get our hearts touched? To feel rosy? To feel a little close to God? To feel fuzzy and spiritual? No! We come here to be trained and equipped and stirred up in love and good works. We come here to become the people He paid for and is willing to empower. So when you get a phone call that you never want to get, all this truth doesn't go away. It actually takes place. And even though there's weeping, and you weep with those who weep, and there's a place to hug and say, I'm so sorry. You know that life moves forward because through Christ, life is forever. And one day we stand before Him and we're glad we believed. And we all rejoice that we ran well and didn't stop running because of how we felt or got caught off guard or the tragedy in the moment. But we realize truth doesn't change. And here's what we all talked about at the door, Crystal and Jake and myself, that, that in the midst of this, there's a stirring and a spurring to live truth all the more because we're living for a goal. And we let this kind of thing sober us toward Him, not get in a quandary and draw back. And they looked and smiled and Miss Crystal said, what else do you do? That is all you do. That is all there is. And I'm like, oh, it did me good to see him this morning. Because I didn't get to talk to him personally since it happened. And, and I just looked over, and you could tell, it was, I just shut down the tears because I wanted to cry when I saw him. Because you weep with those who weep. And he's not trying to be so super, hey, I'm fine, brother, praise the Lord. No, he looked at me and said, man, it's, it's hard sometimes. It's really hard. He lost his daddy unexpectedly. And I just held him. I said, man, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. As sorry as you are, sincerely, there's a higher truth that takes us through today, tomorrow, and the rest of our lives. But see, here's the catch. If you're a Christian believing that now that you're a Christian, those things will never happen, if they happen, you'll be wiped out because you'll be in such a quandary you have no expression of Christ. And it'll be revealed that you were a Christian for your sake, not His name. My buddy Dave, I just seen him out and he's sitting there. His mama just passed. He's fishing with a guy in a boat. And, and Dave's just Dave. You've got to know Dave. Dave's just a happy guy. I don't know how Dave was before I met him. He got to know Jesus a whole lot more since I met him, I know. But Dave's just a good, good guy, and he's known for being the same always. That's a good resume. That's a good testimony. A good name's better than any fine gold or silver. You want a good name. So he's fishing with this guy, and they're talking personal and stuff, and he said, yeah, my mom's passing. Uh, they might, they, she might not make the night. I think that was about the story, something like that. And, and the guy said, what? I mean, and because to him, to the man, Dave seems so okay, and he pictures Dave should be, I guess, sitting somewhere crying. It's not dishonor and respect to mom, it's exalting faith and truth in eternity. He's got a grip. My mother's lived well into her 80s. She's, if, if, man, God, if, if she doesn't get up out of this, this condition she's in, man, she's never going to die. If she's going to be with you, this is a win-win thing. So Dave's like enjoying that he had a long life with Mama, and Mama can't die. She's going to transition with Jesus, and I'm going to keep living well and be well, and we're going to rejoice in the end that we were believers. So when he's like the way he is, the guy's expecting his disposition to reflect Mama in that condition, but his countenance is reflecting Christ in me. It's not a hypo, super spiritual thing. It's belief. And he said to Dave, he said, well, that's amazing, because he's thinking about how Dave is, and he's so okay. See, this is evangelism without you trying. 
Most of us have the pressure of evangelism. Well, I guess I should evangelize. Your life's supposed to evangelize. Your attitude's supposed to evangelize. Your personality is evangelizes. It's your life that evangelizes. You don't just go... Look, if you're just going to try to get them to give you a head nod on the doctrine you're giving them, no, no, no. The Word becomes flesh. They ought to see the doctrine in your life. Then you don't have to push it so hard. <sighs> My buddy Todd says, you know, stop trying to sell the fruit. Let them pick it. So the guy said to Dave, he said, well, there's nobody like you. I've never, I never met anybody like you. See how he is? I wasn't lying, was I? Look. Somebody gets it. <laughs> See, I think, I, think we, I think we think it's dishonoring mom if we're not a mess or something. No, it's honoring God and truth and eternal life and the blood of Jesus. You see what I mean? And, and it doesn't mean he read me a, a thing over the phone that his mom wrote, oh, what, 10, 12 years ago. And he's 15. Oh, okay, 15. And he said, you know, I never felt like or expected I would cry, but when I read that, I cried. And she was writing it about as if she would have passed, and she was like, look, I'll see, don't grieve, da, 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 I'll see you all on the shore, etc. And he said, man, that made me cry. But it wasn't a boo-hoo cry. It was a yay Jesus cry, and all the more reason to keep living in faith. Because guys, watch, we believe. So what do we believe? Just that the car's going to run better today? I hope not, because if it sputters, you're not going to do good. <laughs> so what do we believe? <laughs> Come on, we got to challenge this thing. This is what do we believe? Here's what we get born into. We get born into new life. It says, any man that abides in him and will walk as he walked, right? Even as he walked. It says, walk in the light as he's in the light. So this whole Christian life is you being conformed to His image, being bought by His blood to be brought into Him and Him into you. And what, what, what the Gospel is intending to do and designed to do is change the why behind your life. In other words, why you're alive. Some people are still trying to figure out that. Why am I alive? <laughs> you're alive to be like... Yeah. <laughs> Kids will be with you the whole way through. <laughs> some of you are like, <laughs> I'm hoping some of you are okay. You're like, <laughs> I have the best seat in the house. <laughs> you ought to see the faces. When I first started, they were like, I should have slept in this morning. <laughs> I think this is going to be intense. It's not correcting. It's life-giving. I'm not disciplining anybody here. I'm saying, man, don't be deceived and be a Christian for a reason that you're a Christian for the wrong reason, for, for a reason you're not a Christian. In other words, don't make it something it's not. If it's just all about blessings and you're pursuing blessings and you're just in faith and, and you say, yeah, but I can have anything I ask believing. No, you have, to, you have to remember you denied yourself. You can't just keep praying self-serving things and trying to wrap promises around them. Here's a good example. This is, I'm probably going to get in trouble for this with somebody, but, but just, just open your heart and hear me out. People, people misuse faith and they don't understand. They go, I, pray, I, I just believe I'll never be in a car accident. I'll never be in a car accident. That's not even the purpose of faith to believe you'll never be in a car accident. The purpose of faith is that if you are in a car accident, you look just like Jesus and you have something to give, not just get destroyed and upset and inconvenienced and insurance and bummer and why me and where's God's grace and now I'm mad. Hello? Because your Christianity is fruitless and frivolous if that's our only response. And now we're in a quandary wondering why He's not protecting us at the intersection. Jake's daddy passes. If he's not, if he's not careful, why'd you let this happen, God? My dad wasn't that old. Now I don't even have a dad. God, where, and all of a sudden, if he doesn't have a good grip on who he is and why he's alive and why Christ came, he won't, he'll have so many questions about God, he won't get intimate with God and become more like God. He'll just live in quandary. And he might still come to church and even do this now and then. 
the stuff we do. Whatever we do. But none of that means the devil could care less if you wave a flag in both hands. He could care less that you sit at Praise Community every Sunday. He could care less. He cares when you start thinking like Jesus, looking like Jesus, and walking in love. That's what He cares about. It says He comes for the Word's sake. He doesn't come to give you a bad day. Boy, the devil's really after me. Not at all. Stop being so self-focused. He's not after you at all. He's after the kingdom of God. He's after the things that God's trying to build in your life. When the storm comes to the wise man, it's not because the wise man opened a door, friends, and did something wrong. Listen to the language I'm very familiar with in the church. We go, and I'm not mad at the church, I'm just telling you, we give ourselves away. We say, I just don't know what I'm going through this, why I'm going through this, I don't know what door I opened, I don't know why the devil... Look, a wise man goes through storms. It doesn't mean you did anything wrong. He's coming for the Word's sake. He's after the foundation. He's after the thing God's building. And if you take the adversity personal, the thing that He's building will fall. He's not... He's, he could care less about you. If it wasn't about the kingdom and you didn't have the potential of the kingdom, He wouldn't even notice you. It says He comes for the Word's sake. He doesn't come to give you a bad day. He's trying to destroy the kingdom in people. And that's why sometimes really tragic, surprising, quandary things cause so much of a ripple effect because we're not rooted and grounded in some of these truths and some of us have the idea that God's just here to take care of my every day. No, He's here to make sure I have everything necessary to be like Him. He predestined me, Romans 8, to be conformed to the image of His Son. Who He predestined, He called. Who He called, He justified. Who He justified, He glorified. How did He glorify us? By filling us with the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead. Now watch. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Watch. For if He did not spare His own Son, but delivered Him up for us all, how shall He not freely give us all things through His Son. He's not talking about full vats and barns. He's talking about everything necessary in the context of being conformed to the image of His Son. What He's saying is He will give us everything necessary to be like Him if we're willing. Do you know how people live with a lot of rights without realizing it because we were trained a certain way? Do you, do you all do realize that we grew up in a lie, right? Like, you, you realize we all grew up very self-centered, self-conscious, esteem issues, trying to fit in, wanting to be honored and acknowledged. You, you guys do all realize that happened to every one of us, right? And some of us are Christians, and it still has power. <laughs> Who thinks what, how I look, what they said. Come on. We, we find our value through looks, appearance, relationships. All of a sudden, you're very young age in life, and life is fashioning you and deciding who you are and how you are. And we've all been through stuff, and how you responded to what you've been through determines what your life looks like. But it's not even you. It's a product of life. Instead of the one that wants to live inside of you. Are you guys with me? You do all understand that, right? You all understand that before you were even able to consciously think you were very self-focused and self-centered, survival-driven. Like you couldn't even talk English and you were angry. You take that binky and they ain't ready to get rid of the binky. <laughs> Cutest little thing on the planet. You'll hug them for hours and hold them and cuddle them and spoil them and won't even let them sleep in the crib. They'll sleep in your arms. But you take that binky when they don't want you to take that binky. <laughs> They'll turn other colors trying to get noise out. And it's not because they're happy. You take a toy from them when they're two years old that they ain't done playing with. You get a little two-year-old friend playing with them and you're sipping tea. Praise Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You got your little Bibles open. Oh, they're so sweet. Praise the Lord. And they're just playing. And all of a sudden, the one picks up a toy that the other one ain't even caring about. And he goes... And now they're fighting over the same toy. Didn't even know the toy was on the planet until the other kid touched it. <laughs> you tell me God did that? You tell me God made people that way? Absolutely not. 
That's what we became living life apart from Him and everyone was born into Adam and you must be born again. And somehow, we made born again a beneficial prayer that takes us to heaven and gives us vats and barns that are filled instead of a life transformed in an agreement with truth. Amen. Come on! You tell me God made kids that way? Not a chance. You think God made you to just be frustrated and indignant and jealous and proud and insecure? Upset and judgmental? Look, I'm not slamming you. We've all expressed levels of that list. The Bible says put off those things and let the list be long. And then put on the new. Tenderhearted and merciful. I ain't being no pushover. Ain't nobody making me a doormat. See, that's the old man. You don't incorporate him into your life and stay the same. It's not Jesus incorporated. You're not the CEO. I'm serious. I was preaching in Alabama, probably something like this. And this young boy, he's driving home from the service. He got so shook by what I was saying because he's like, he's driving, he's thinking, I got religion. I just got a doctrine. I just know the language. See, it's a peculiar thing. I, I don't know Spanish. Probably would be good to learn it. There's a lot of situations I could use Spanish. But here's the deal. If I took the time to learn Spanish, or one of you gracious people would sit me down and help teach me Spanish, I could speak Spanish the rest of my life, but it'll never make me Spanish. You can learn the Christian language. And you can say all the things we say. <laughs> but it ain't going to make you like him. <laughs> Whoa. You did so good this morning. You really did good. I really liked you a lot. <laughs> I did. I'm just telling you. I'm glad you're right in the front because I wanted to ignore. I thought, where did she go? And I didn't realize you were right. I just went, there she is. <laughs> so close, I almost reached you. When you were playing that guitar and, and they were at the end there, you just did good all morning. I just want to bless you and say you did. She did amazing. <laughs> Full of heart. We're not learning a language. Amen, brother. When I was a pastor, people backslid and said hallelujah. When, when you talked to them, you, you knew they weren't doing well, and you talking to them to talk to them and get them private because you knew you're a pastor. There's just discernments you get sometimes, and God gives you ins on people's lives, and you pull them in a room, and, and they're still talking the language. Well, amen, brother. No, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Yeah. I'm like, hey, listen, we need to talk. It's easy to talk the language. Anybody can learn any language. It's becoming like Him that matters. This boy in Alabama is driving home. The Spirit of the Lord. I love this, Adam. He came in his car while he was driving. The Lord came in and overwhelmed him while he was driving. And he said, he said, he said, you are no longer the CEO of Jesus Incorporated. You're fired. That's what the Lord said to the boy. And he went, and he pulled over and just cried and repented and surrendered his life to the Lord. I just, that's where I got the CEO thing. The Lord said it to the young man. He said, you think you've incorporated me into your life and you're running the corporation? You're fired. <laughs> he lost his job, man. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? What a freedom. Deny yourself. Pick up your cross. Follow me. How do you deny yourself and have rights? Well, I feel. Well, I think. Well, yeah, but. Well, they shouldn't. Well, they're the one that called. Well, they. No, no, no. Listen. Life taught you to be that way, not the Spirit of God. Do you understand that the emotions you grew up with are all twisted, 180 degrees perverted? How can you say that, Dan? God gave us emotions. No, no, not the ones you grew up with. He didn't. Don't you credit him for that. They're wacky, guys. You know it. Your emotions, my emotions, they were unstable and they got us in a lot of trouble. Don't you say God made us that way. You became that way being born separate from God, self-conscious. All your emotions evolved out of a self-centered platform where it was all about you. 
That's why the first thing a man has to do to become born again is deny himself. We teach just pray this prayer and go to heaven. No, no, no. Die to everything you were so everything He is can come alive in you. Why? Because if not, we're just going to speak a thing without representing a thing. And we're going to say He's amazing without being amazing. And then you're just trying to get people to agree with your doctrine instead of be touched by your life. Are you guys with me? Come on. Uh, discouragement. I know, I, I know people could struggle with this one. Discouragement's unscriptural. It's not, even, it's not even scriptural to be a discouraged Christian. Just, there's no such thing as a Christian that's discouraged scripturally. You say, brother, that's too hardcore. No, it isn't. Listen, if you're discouraged, where's discouragement come from? Where's your focus if you're discouraged? Are you thinking for the kingdom at all if you're discouraged? Because the last time I found, he's the God of all hope and he is not discouraged. Like, you think he should be in our minds, right? He sees the world all at once and he's still full of faith and excited. He probably didn't watch CNN, huh? <laughs> Maybe he doesn't have cable. Maybe that's how God stays so encouraged. He doesn't watch the news. He's omniscient. He knows everything. And he stays the same. Must be because he's love. Must be because he doesn't live for people to live toward him. He lives this way. Come on, if you're discouraged, if you're discouraged, you be real with me. Be honest with me. And let me mess with you a little bit. Where's that coming from? Where's the foundation for it to stay alive? Where's your focus if you're truly discouraged? on how you're doing and how things are going and what it's doing to you and the position it's putting in you in everything is self-focused. You follow me? So if Jesus had a self-focus and He came and did good things so people liked Him, He's discouraged. If He didn't have His identity established and if He had esteem issues and He needed encouraged... You know how we always say, well, everybody needs encouraged. The Lord encourages you. You encourage yourself in the Lord. And then it's so healthy because then only people can just cheer you on in what you're already moving in. But if you need encouraged, then you're, then you're only as good as people are doing you. And yet we'll sing He's Lord and let everything else decide us. You guys all right? I hope it's not my preaching. It's too good. You can't walk out on this kind of preaching. Unless you have an appointment or something. Stay sitting for a little. If you have to go to the bathroom, I believe God will help you hold it. <laughs> John, you were right here. Do you remember that time in the marketplace when I had to go to the bathroom so bad? Do you remember you were talking and talking and talking, John? Do you remember talking and talking and talking? And, and I had to go to the bathroom and you kept talking and talking and talking and talking. And... <laughs> And we're sitting there, and I was just there to pray for people. And, and I, you guys will get this. I don't know how it is for you girls. I've never been a girl. But, but it was to the point where I was rocking and bouncing, remember? And I said, John, look, i got to cut out of this conversation. i got, I got to get to that bathroom. I hope I didn't wait too long. It was one of them psychologically where you think you're getting so close to the bathroom you can't take it no more. And I was I think, I can't have an accident in the middle of the Thomasville Marketplace because it's elbow to elbow, man. And I'm like, this isn't good. Remember that? And I got up and I said, I got to go, John. He said, okay, okay. I said, whew. As soon as I get to the doors, a lady comes through the little swing doors. It was like a saloon doors on the thing. She comes through and she starts crying and said, can I talk to you? I said, absolutely, sure, come on. We sat right down. Do you remember? She got touched too, man. And 45 minutes later, we're hugging and she's crying and we're praising God and she left and me and John are sitting there talking. And he goes, you know, you never did go to the bathroom. I said, you know, I don't even have to. It's just cool little stuff. Do you remember that? Ooh. See, I have a living witness here. You say, yeah, all right, brother. <laughs> so you have no excuse to get up and leave on me right now. We're going to believe God for supernatural whatever. Control. No. I, I'm going to be done soon anyway. Listen, this is so important. Let me give you some scripture on this, Pastor. 
Hebrews 12, 3, consider Him. Who's our eyes fixed on? Him. Sometimes I get concerned that we follow our own experience more than we follow His life. And I get more concerned that we follow others' experiences more than we follow His own life. And then we sell grace short and don't become what He paid for because we become what we're used to. It's a supernatural life. He wants to empower you to be what you can never be on your own. He wants you to believe. Right? It says, consider him who endured such hostility against himself from sinners, lest you be weary. Oh, they got it up there? Look at that. I'm preaching the gospel. Did I say it word for word? For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. That's NASB. The New King James Version says that you wouldn't be discouraged. Same thing, lose heart and discourage. Same thing, grow weary and lose heart. Hebrews 10, it says, 35 and 6, it says, you have need of endurance so that after you do the will of God, you can receive the reward or the promise. You have need of what? Endurance if you're ever going to fulfill the will of God. So if this gospel is about you having a, a, a glassy sea smooth day, you wouldn't need endurance. If you'd never be challenged. Remember, remember Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, them three boys? Uh, Veggie Tales did a great job with it. You watch it. I'm a, I'm a crybaby. I watched Veggie Tales when my granddaughter was small. We'd watch that rack shack and Benny thing. And when that light shaft would come into that furnace, I would cry. So my granddaughter would be sitting there going like this, waiting for Grandpa to cry. We're watching, and she's like, okay, he's going to cry. She was little, and she, because she knew I would cry, because I'd be like, that's Jesus. He came in to save him. And I mean, it's a pickle and a <laughs> asparagus head and stuff. But it's a truth. It's a truth that wrecks me. Because them boys, they, they were covenant boys. They're Old Testament. They don't have the revelation we have. They don't have the finished work of the cross. They're just, they're just Israelite. They're just Hebrew boys. Well, they were young men, probably in their 20s, probably. I don't know. But the king comes because they won't bow to his image. Guys, why? We're made for His image. You don't bow to other image. You're made for His image. You don't make another image Lord. It's all prophetic. There's all connotation here. The king said, hey, they brought it to my awareness that when that music played, you didn't bow and worship the image. No. Nope. He said, do you understand that anyone that doesn't bow gets thrown into the fire of the furnace and... and, and and they said, what is your fire to us, O king? For we don't have a need to answer you in this matter. Do you know most of us get tricked into praying for no fire? They were saying the fire has nothing to do. Your fire has nothing to do with why we did or didn't bow. We're not bowing because you're not Lord. He is. Fire or no fire, the truth stays the same. That's called love not your own life unto death, zero compromise. It was not about their well-being. It was about them honoring what they knew to be true. That's how the fourth man shows up in the fire. When you're afraid of the fire, there's no authority over the fire. When you're not afraid of the fire, you walk in total authority because you only have authority over what you don't fear. Come on. Trying to teach you something here. Get a little militant with you. What is your fire to us, O King? We make it about the fire. We make it about what we're going through and how we feel and how tough it's been instead of who He is in the midst. I said it for years. I woke up on my bed one morning and the Lord spoke it to me about my own life because some people had done some real wrong things and said some bad things, lie stuff. Totally misconstrued situation. And that night I got up and preached after it all happened, and, and, and then I woke up in the morning, and it wasn't my fault. I woke up in the morning, I opened my eyes to the Lord hovering over me, and it felt like He was hugging me. It was overwhelming. I didn't even know if I could get out of bed and function. You think you're ready for that. So, I just want an encounter with the Lord. It was so overwhelming. It was a good overwhelming, but I didn't think I was going to make it through. It was so overwhelming, it seemed too good to be true, and it felt like I could have died any moment. It was just overwhelming. He's hovering over me, because if you stand and prophesy God's pleased with you, it might bring a tear to somebody's eye. 
But if the Lord's hovering over you in your bedroom when you open your eyes and His presence is manifest and He's whispering, I'm so proud of you, you can't even breathe. And I'm laying there freaking out, crying so hard, and He's just hugging on me. That's all I can tell you. He's hugging on me. And I was like, Lord, I don't even know what's going on. So I, I was in my mind, I'm thinking, I can't even get up and function. I'm going to be a wash rag all day. I was so mushed. And He told me, that yesterday when that all took place, you didn't let any of that touch your heart. When you spoke, and you had the authority of the pulpit, you didn't say one thing to address that. You spoke what I was saying. And you didn't allow the authority I gave you to be used to make a point, prove a point, or decide a thing. And he said, you didn't let that thing that happened change you. You shined. And he said, I'm so proud of you. Overwhelms me that the God of the universe would say he's proud of a human being. That tells me he made me to be a son, not just a human being. And that tells me he put his life in me and he sees us as one. He doesn't just see me as Dan Moeller with a social security number and an address. He, he paid a ridiculous price to obtain me and live in me. And he laid on me and here's what he said. He said, Dan, it's simple. This is where I got the phrase from the Lord. When you squeeze an orange, you expect orange juice. If any other juice came out, it would be strange. He said, why isn't it strange when you squeeze a Christian and everything but Jesus comes out? And he whispered and said, that ought to be strange. And I took it to heart and said, that ought to be strange. If you're going to squeeze me, Jesus, squeeze me. Unfair, unjust, whatever circumstance, crisis, bah, Jesus, bah, Jesus. That sure beats, well, that ain't fair. Well, they shouldn't have did that to me. Well, they should know better. Well, they started it. Look, victim, villain, everybody loses. Because the victim's a victim and the villain's a villain. This isn't complicated. Everybody loses. Ooh, I feel, I don't know what's up with that one. Listen, guys. Victim, villain, is not the Lord. Christ in you, the hope of glory. What they put you through, what they did to you, is not the point. That's victim, villain. Now all you can see them for is what they did wrong, and all you see yourself for is what they did to you. And that's a false identity and a lie from hell. Well, I can feel that in the room. That's amazing. As I pounded a little more, not to make you mad, to get that lie busted up. Listen, the, the biggest trap of the enemy is to get you to feel sorry for yourself through trauma and tragedy and trial, and that doesn't make me insensitive to say it. I just have faith to say it. Feeling sorry for yourself is the biggest lie because we have already denied ourselves, guys. It's not about who did what to you. It's about what he did for you and what he wants to do through you. And if we get stuck on what happened to us instead of what happened to him, we're going to get an identity through our lives instead of His. Come on, that's just strong and straight. I can still feel that thing in me. There's some, there's some real wrestling in this room on that thing. Throw away feeling sorry for yourself and don't call me insensitive. You don't know what I've been through. You say, well, you don't know what I've been through. You don't know what anybody's been through. Stop making what you've been through, Lord. Listen, let's not reduce ourselves to find out who's been through the most hell in this room and then sing it's all about heaven. Because I thought the old man's dead, and I thought yesterday's dead, and I thought Paul said the one thing I do to move forward is forget what lies behind. Why are we still making it matter? Nobody can make up for it. He paid a price to get you out of it and change your identity and make you new. He doesn't want to touch you wrong. He wants to breathe life into you. So don't live off of the day you were touched wrong. Live off of the life. And thank God that he snatched you out of darkness and transferred you into the and live by faith, not memory of yesterday. You guys with me? I just saw you guys. Hi. <laughs> Are you guys okay? Come on, man. This is life in Christ. And it, it seems militant, but it's really not. It's just, man, it's strong and authoritative. And all of a sudden, nothing's going to decide who you are and what you are but Him. Yay. Why? Because you settle through relationship and communion with the Lord that that you have a reason for being. And when you wake up, 
You wake up to shine. You wake up to love. You wake up to be like Him. If you're just waking up for the day, if, if this is the front of your fridge and you just have faith scriptures plastered everywhere and they all pertain to your blessings, your breakthrough, your provision, and your day, you're probably going to assess your day at the end to see how much your faith's working and how faithful God's been, and you're going to consume every day on praying for smooth things and miss the whole point of why He's in you. We do it in the church, guys. We think our faith is like to catch green lights. It just freaks me out. We think our faith is to believe for a convenient parking spot. No, it's real. I hear the conversations. I got faith working, man. I make it all through, all the way through town every morning, and I hit every light green. That doesn't make you a man of God. Here's what you're missing. When yours is green, somebody's red, but somehow you don't think about that. When you're in the best parking spot, somebody's not. You're supposed to prefer others and consider others more highly than yourself, not use faith for benefit. You use faith to move mountains. You use faith to stay the same in the face of trials. You use faith to be like Him so that people can see who He is through your life and want Him. He said, if you forgive they'll be forgiven. Why? What he's saying is if you walk in love like I've loved you and you manifest to them what I've manifested to you that's turned your heart, their hearts are turned to me too. You get it? Come on. Evangelism isn't some kind of pressure where we've got to go win the city. You, know, you let Jesus win you and evangelism is an automatic response. Love is evangelistic. Listen, I want to cheer you on today and tell you that if there's anything trying to eat your lunch and discourage you or pull you away from living this way, I'm telling you it's a lie because He came to give you life and life more abundantly. That has nothing to do with the convenience of your circumstances. That has to do with the perspective and reason for being. Don't let anything take away your faith. Adam and I talked about this, Pastor and I, this morning uh, in another conversation. I didn't even know I'd be talking about all this stuff. It just won't leave me. And it probably, this morning we were so there, it's probably, and then I, I saw Jake and Crystal at the door and it just, it just grabbed my heart. And you guys blessed me this morning. You really did. I just want to honor you. You blessed me this morning with your response. And I'm not going to think any less of Jake and Crystal feet of fellow me and cried and bawled. It doesn't change truth. We just continue to minister truth. But I was impressed with how they're responding to something that's very real and tragic. I'm not denying that. It's very unfortunate timing and tragic. And uh, you have to, you have to you, you get through that with truth. But I want to encourage you to See, He came to give you life and life more abundantly. So the way you're processing, if the way you're handling your mindset about things isn't producing life, it can't be the Lord. You guys with me? He came to give you life and life more abundantly. If you just get into a bummer mode and you just say, yeah, but and you lay it all out like a court case, the whys and the ins and the outs, and it's subduing your disposition and crushing your joy or your expression, well, then your reasoning can't be in the wisdom of the Lord. Are you guys with me? You say, yeah, but damn, what are you saying? We're not supposed to ever grieve or anything? You're not supposed to let anything outside of truth decide the full and exp uh, true expression of who you are. Do we weep for a season? Absolutely. Do we grieve? Yeah, but not as those with no hope. There's a difference between a believer. He has a higher calling. He has a destiny that he's living toward. He's not wrapping all his faith around now. His faith is taking him to them. Here, to, to, to then. Here's what the Bible says. The devil seeks around like a roaring lion, seeking what? Whom he may devour. It's 1 Peter chapter 5. It's there. And it says, resist him. That doesn't mean punch him in the mouth or tell him he's a jerk or remind him of his future. <laughs> Don't get in a mouth battle with the devil. Just stop it. Usually that just shows insecurity and sometimes immaturity and... and if he could, he'll make you pay for that. I'm not afraid of him. You just don't have to poke him. You don't have to poke him. Don't poke him. Ignore him. He's a cut-off withering branch coming to nothing. Stay submitted to God. Keep your focus on truth. Look, he's seeking whom he may what? So what's he looking for? He's looking for those phone conversations. Well, if this keeps happening, I'm just going to give up. I'm just going to give up. Well, I've had about enough. Well, I don't know why they always have to. Well, I'm just telling you what. He's looking for that stuff. That's vulnerability. He's just seeking whom he may devour. Look at the next verse. 
You want to flip that verse to verse 9? But resist him. Now here's how. Comma. The answer. It doesn't mean punch him in the mouth. It doesn't mean talk to him. Here's how you resist him. Firm in your faith. I have a new King James. It says steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same experiences and suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. Don't turn inward. Don't take it personal. Don't feel sorry for yourself. Everybody's going through challenges. Don't be a sellout when you're bought with a price. Yeah? That's what it's saying. And resist him standing steadfast in the faith. Continue to believe who you are and why you are, and that's how you resist him. Submit to God, resist the devil, he will flee. And if he doesn't flee right away, he'll just keep building you in Christ and teaching you how to resist and become strong. He'll just help establish you. You see, he comes with the intention of breaking you. He's not impressed with your church attendance, remember? He doesn't believe you love God. He believes you need God, and there's a difference. And he's out to prove it. He doesn't believe you love God. He believes you need him. He's not impressed with men. He's been messing with men for generations. I could picture him now. Yeah, yeah, remember the garden? Ha, ha. Men. He tells, he tells God in the book of Job, he said, come on, you know, man. Job blessed? Job different? Job different? Job like no other man? Are you kidding? He's like everybody else. You strip away the blessings. You've hedged him in. You made him fat in the land. You take away the fat that you've blessed him with, and he'll curse you to your face like every other man. That's what he said to God. The devil said that to God in Job. You take away his blessing, you'll see his true colors. He's only being nice because you treated him good. You take away what you treated him good with and his true colors will come out and that same man will curse you to, him, to your face and you know it. Because all men are the same. That's what the devil's saying. Yeah? That's sobering. We ought to read this stuff. The next chapter he says, hey, skin for skin, a man will do anything to save his own life. Right in the book of Job, the devil talking to God. That tells you what he believes about you. Ha ha, praise community, yeah, right. We'll see. He's out to find out what you really believe. You say, Dan, you're freaking me out. Are you prophesying doom and gloom and despair and hardship? No, nope. I'm telling you the same sufferings are happening to your brother and all around. And he's seeking like a Roman lion who he can devour. Just be one that can't be devoured because you're steadfast in the faith and to just live by faith and you fight the good fight of faith and we're believers. Yeah. 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 I'm feeling that. You guys okay? This is just a pep talk this morning. Why? Because if you gather yourself together, it's for one reason. It's not to feel good about your Christianity. It's not to put a check in the book and say, I was there. It's not. I'm not being smart. The one reason we gather, and even the more so when we see that day approaching, is what? To stir one another in love and good works. This thing never has been just about your basket of blessings. It's never been about just provision. It's not about just... Prov it's amazing how it's just always about our gain if we're not careful. You look at the thousands of messages out there and it's always about what you can get from Him instead of what you can become because of Him. What you get from Him doesn't change the world. What you become because of Him will change the world. Here's how I know... Not that I need to prove I'm right in what I'm saying. My convictions tell me that. But here's how I know it's right. There are churches all over this country filled by millions of people right now as I stand here. And some a couple hours from now because the time changes. But all across this land today, churches will be filled by millions of people. You agree? You could fill every seat in every church all across the country today and somehow we'd call that revival. Listen, going to church will never change the world. Becoming like Him is the only thing that will change the world. Becoming love will. Going to church won't. Men have been going to church for generations. It's time we preach become in love, lay down our life, love not our own life unto death, and love less our mother, father, spouse, children, houses, land, yes, our own life. When I did home group years ago, I don't know if Kimmy remembers this, my wife, but when I was... About nine months old to a year, we opened our home group at nine months old. I was a little over that, and I was upstairs, and I got a revelation from the Lord about loving not my own life. And I come down in the home group, and, and I tore button, buttons right off of my little shirt I had on because I was clenching. I know you can't picture me that passionate, 
but I got passionate. And I was on my knees because the room was crowded. And I pointed to my wife and I said, you look at her. I said, that's the wife of my youth. That's the mother of our two children. And I love her. But I said, you take her from me. And everybody's like, and I looked at my kids and I said, they're my children. And I said, you take them from me. You burn down this house and you take the shirt. And I, I popped the buttons. People were like, so you take the shirt off my back. You can't stop me now. We have already won. And they're all looking at me like, I don't think this is the sermon we came to your house for. I don't. I thought you were going to get like words of knowledge and pray for the sick and bless us. And <laughs> I was crawling across my living room, looking at him. I'm crying. Take her from me. I'm telling you, them kids, you burn this house. Boop, boop, pop my buttons. I said, you can't stop me now. And I'm like, and they're like, we just want to go to heaven. <laughs> Please, we just want God to protect everything that's dear to us, and we just want to go to heaven. Could you preach another sermon? <laughs> See, no, because it's amazing. Because in that season, there was a missionary who, who went to Indonesia, and, or Burma and all that stuff, Burma mainly, and he went there and he met a man. He met a man who was a Hindu priest who got born again. Sounds like good news. woo the Hindus are turning to Christ. Yeah. Well, hold your cheers for a second. Because the Hindu priest went into the village and he couldn't do the Hindu ceremonies because he's born again now and he has a revelation of Jesus because Jesus really went, bam, inside of him. So now, to the Hindu faith people, the priest is preaching the gospel in Jesus and they said, you've gone loco. We don't believe in this heresy. We're Hindus. And they kicked him out of the temple. The next day he came back in to the temple like he's still the priest. And he begins to preach Jesus. Guess what they do? Bam, 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 bam. They beat him all up. And he throw him out of the city. Next day, guess what he does? Goes right back in and starts sharing and preaching Jesus. Bam, bam, bam. Now you listen carefully. You get somebody to punch you hard in the mouth preaching Jesus. And tell me if you're ready to real quick preach about Jesus. They beat this man up. He goes back to his house, his wife and his children and their little milk cow is all standing there together crying and his little shanty hut, little stick house thing is burned to the ground. All for the gospel. Americans, if we're not careful, American version of Christianity, not good. Well, now they see, that's what makes me mad about God. Why doesn't he protect that man? That man's going out of his way, trying to preach the gospel, getting beat up, and why can't he cover his back and take care of his house and... Because we're living on a different plane of understanding and wisdom and we'll spout off and snap off and be wise in our own opinion, but our own opinion is not doing our heart well and it's not producing life. So our opinion's not right. <laughs> Man goes back in, builds up his little house, he gets it built back up, it's a true story. He goes back in, preaches, beat up, beat up, beat up. Now he comes back, his house burns down, but he can't find his wife and kids. Say, I don't think you're ready for this story. Can't find his wife and kids. He's looking, he's calling their names. He goes over to the river and he looks and there's his wife face down in the river. There's his two children and his milk cow laying on its side and they're all dead. His whole family. Because he's born again. Love less. Seek ye. I don't know if we're ready for this in America. Air conditioners, heaters, so controlled. Everything's so controlled to our comfort. And all of a sudden we have a gospel that takes care of us instead of changes us and puts diligence and discipline and honor back in our lives. I'm just concerned that if tragedy hits this country in the Christian realm, that the best we're prepared to do is picket. That's my biggest concern, that we'll just fill buses and march Washington with picket signs of dissatisfaction instead of become like Christ and walk in love. So what do you do? He goes right back in the city and preaches Jesus. You say, you've got to be kidding. You're out of your mind. No, he's out of our minds. He knows what he's doing. He had an encounter. He preaches Jesus, gets beat up every day. Watch this. True story. Whole year. A whole year goes by. And all he has is a dead wife, dead kids, a dead milk cow, a burned down house, and beat up 365 days. Guess where he's living? He goes to the dump. 
And he finds plastic and stuff, and he builds a little tarp and a shanty, and he stays out of the weather under that thing, and he's living by the dump, and he's scrapping through the thing to find food scraps and leftover things, and that's how he's living for a whole year. Well, if God, well, I don't, well, that's why, well, see, I'm mad at God. A year goes by, and a man came out to the dump to visit him. He said, can I talk to you? He said, sir, I, yes. He said, sir, I used to think you're loco. We'd beat you up every day, and I got, I just hit me. I just realized something. You know something. You're either loco or you know something, and I'm believing you know something. And what can you know so much that would cost you your whole family and every day getting beat up and still speak the same thing and not change? I want to know what you know. And he asked him to explain. One whole year cost him his wife and his kids. Listen, this thing cost God his son in that moment, and he raised him from the dead. It cost him his family. He's raising them from the dead. It's not changed. Death has no dominion over us. We're not to fear death. We're to have authority over death because he holds the keys. Death's not finality. Some of us are living to live, afraid to die, instead of living him. Some of us only pray because we're afraid we're going to die. We don't pray because of promise and length of days and fulfilling His will. Some of us just get tricked in being afraid of death. You have no authority over what you fear. This missionary met these guys and heard their story. The, kid, the young man got totally gloriously born again. The guy had one convert after a year. And then the missionary sent him to Bible school and paid for him to have a church built in that area. And they began to minister and evangelize, and people started getting born again. It cost him his wife, his kids, it cost him his milk cow, and a lot of beatings. And all of a sudden, the kingdom of God is spreading through the land. You say, well, he cost God his son. It shouldn't have to cost him everything. God sent his son to die. He, his parents, his family shouldn't have to die. Shh, be really careful with your quick opinions. What do you do if you're a missionary? I know, I know missionaries like this. One in particular, he said, sometimes they unload their guns on your people. And when the smoke clears, nobody got hit by a bullet. And we just love that in America. We love those stories. Woo! Praise God! Woo! That's what we do. But he looked at me real sober in the eyes, and he said, but many a times that smoke clears, and they're all laying there dead. That's when you better understand the kingdom you're fighting for and not take the lost person and turn inward and give up and turn tail and grow weary and well-doing and not reap a reward. That's where you better settle. Oh, I'm in this thing for keeps and I got one option, going after him, period. Come hell, come high water, I'm a wise man because he's the Lord. And you know I'm right because look at my hair color. <laughs> I'm just telling you to be a wise man. My hair ain't white because of stress. <laughs> <laughs> Ain't it a pretty white? It's got to be wisdom. You guys hearing me this morning? Not just because I'm shouting and passionate. You hearing me? Listen, you got to decide every time. This is, a, this, is the, this is the amazing thing about the gospel. You're the steward of your own heart. You're the steward of your own life. And you're to guard your own heart, not somebody else's. You don't listen to this sermon for somebody else. You listen to it for you. And you let Holy Spirit empower you through faith to become everything He paid for you to be. And you say, you know what? I'm going to get my motive so straight. I'm going to go before the Lord and I'm going to establish a reason for being that no matter what's going on, I'm still, I'm not opening my life up for tragedy, guys. I'm not expecting bad things to happen. I'm saying my whole reason for being is to be like Him in the face of it all. You still believe for protection over your children. You still thank God that His, His grace is on your hubby as He's leaving for work. I'm not saying you just open up your life to get pummeled. What I'm saying is, when things happen, you live prepared because you believe right. And there's more expression of Christ in the midst. Are you guys with me? So that cancels discouragement. We never grow weary in well-doing. We always shine as lights and the world sees He's God. Amen? So a man's in a boat with my buddy Dave and he says, there's nobody like you. And all of a sudden, this guy is challenged with an expression of something he didn't know was possible, but knew it was real. And then Dave laughed and said, oh, no, there's a lot of people like this. And it's just Dave, and he started telling me. <laughs> Isn't that how it happened? But did it get the guy thinking? All of a sudden, the guy has another way to consider that's probably the way. 
Amen? I'm going to let Adam close this out as a pastor. I just came to cheer you on. I don't feel like I'm going to do anything else because that was a sober, strong word, and I just want you to go home with it. Can I pray over you all? Thanks for letting me speak freely. I know you didn't have much of a chance. You just sat there and they gave me the mic, but... Thanks for enduring and bearing with me, and I know i got a little passion. I can't help it. It's, this stuff's real. and Your life is worth His blood to Him. So it's nothing wrong with passion. He, if you ever watched a, a crucifixion movie, it was way worse than they're trying to portray if you read your Bible. So don't think this thing isn't serious. He must think a lot of us and our lives and our potential. He must really value our potential, guys. So Father, I just thank You that truth continue to burn in our hearts. That, Father, that victim-villain thing that I felt so much static and feedback on, that I pray that would be settled by Your Spirit in the hearts of everyone that was struggling. Lord, that we're not being insensitive. We're not that we don't care about the bad things that went, but that we would never let them be the deciding factor of who we are in our day now that we have a new one through You. So, Lord, let there be a sanctification today. Let there be an empowerment. Let there be an impartation of truth that keeps us, God, in a very solid and healthy way. I bless this house. I pray for wisdom in the leadership and that this will be a place of unity and strength. In Jesus' name. Amen? If you enjoyed this message, please visit danmolerarchive.com to find over 2,500 more messages from Dan, all organized by category, playlist, and search. Enjoy.